Coming on the hop, on the hop. Let's move, guys. Six months after the worst loss in franchise history, the 1997 Denver Broncos reported for training camp. In 1996, the Broncos won 13 games. They were the top seed in the American Football Conference, but they lost their playoff opener to the Jacksonville Jaguars, a team in only its second year of existence. Even though I'd lost three Super Bowls before that, that Jacksonville game was the biggest loss of my life. I was coming to near the end of my career, and we really had a good football team, thought that that was going to be our year to really compete and get back to the Super Bowl. We got the home field advantage wrapped up, and then Jacksonville comes in and beats us as a wild card team. And so that was probably the most devastating loss that uh, I'd ever been through, including the Super Bowl, just because of where I was in my career in the 14th year. So the season that has such great high hopes and a Bronco team that for the most part of the year led the NFL in record will come to a close here on this divisional playoff game. This one is history. In an effort to put the Jacksonville loss behind him, head coach Mike Shanahan spent the offseason looking to upgrade his already talented roster through free agency. One of the things I learned very early in my career is that you better take advantage of every opportunity you get because you never know who's watching. Turned out the Denver Broncos had been watching me. What Mike Shanahan saw in Carolina Panther Howard Griffith was a punishing fullback who could both block and be a receiving threat. In the Broncos, Griffith saw a talented team with a consummate leader. 37-year-old quarterback John Elway was so driven to win a Super Bowl that barely a month after the Jacksonville loss, he was back working out. Griffith's free agent tour of the NFL began and ended in Denver. After meeting with Shanahan that morning, I said, well, coach, I've got to go to Detroit. Uh, there were a lot of appealing things there. Obviously, Barry Sanders was still there playing. And he looks me in my eye calmly and says, you're not going to make that flight. I said, well, why not? Said, you're not leaving here. We got your agent on the phone in the other room. You're going to be a Denver Bronco. We're going to make this happen. I'm like, oh, good, just what I want. I'm finally a free agent, get a chance to shop my wares, and the first guy won't even let me out the building. When I sat back and looked at the opportunity, I felt, coming from Carolina, that Denver was the best team. They should have won the Super Bowl the year before, had that mishap against Jacksonville at Mile High Stadium. Hey, hey, keep the pressure on now, keep the pressure on. Don't let up, pressure, pressure. Bronco's inability to pressure Jaguars quarterback Mark Brunel had cost them in the playoffs. To upgrade the pass rush, Denver signed a familiar Western Division rival, free agent Neil Smith. When I was with Kansas City, Denver was one of those um, cities that um, we just couldn't get it done. It didn't matter if we was up by 14 with two minutes left. You know, that name again, John Elway, always found a way to come back and beat us. Out of the nine years that I played there, I've only won that one, so it goes to show you how tough it was. During those nine years in Kansas City, Smith had 86 and a half sacks. It was just as tough on the Broncos. Ironically, it was John Elway, the man Smith had tormented for so many seasons, who was largely responsible for making sure Smith became a Bronco. John actually gave up money to, to make cap room just to get me there. At that point in time uh, in my career, it, was about, it wasn't about the money. It was about, I was running out of time and I wanted to win a championship. And having played against Neil when he was in Kansas City for so many years and knew what a thorn he was in my side in Kansas City, he could do nothing but help us in Denver. And so uh, I thought that was a great move by Mike and I was glad to be able to help get him there. Fullback Howard Griffith, number 29 was also a welcome addition. Who's that, Griffith? Yeah. Yeah, got a prototype fullback body. During the grueling two-a-day practices of summer camp, the prototypical fullback quickly learned the Bronco system. Just as quickly, 
Griffith learned who was excused from those two-a-day practices. John, come practice with us in the morning, and then he's gone. He's got the afternoon off. And that was one of the things. He didn't want to burn John out. That was something I really owed Mike, by him allowing me to miss the morning practice, and I felt fresher in the afternoon. And, and so body, for my body, it was a lot better, especially at my age and the number of hits I'd taken throughout my career. It allowed me to stay fresh and stay sharp during training camp and not wear myself out before we got into the long season. Nobody looked at it like, ah, uh, you know, why can't we get that? You knew why he got it. It's John Elway. Elway as every Bronco before him had always worn an orange jersey, but in a move that stirred passionate reactions and hoped to alter playoff fortunes, Denver changed colors. Die-hard Bronco fans will always love the old uniforms. And they were hideous looking, but it's kind of when you grow up with something, it grows on, you get attached to it. They did not want to let go of it. I didn't like them. Of course, I had to be the model. I was the model when they first came out, and Mr. Bowen asked me to do that, so I did that. But I did not like them, just because they weren't orange. Do a little pirouette for us here, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough of that. I had enough problems getting them here, you guys. <laughs> After seeing those light powder blue helmets, I really didn't know how I was going to fit with a big D on my helmet. I thought they was one of the ugliest uniforms ever. Yeah, baby, trying to rock the house. All right, baby. Once I seen those new uniforms, I almost chose to go to Denver because I loved them. I, mean, I thought it was the perfect uniform for the perfect situation. It's the beginning, baby, for a good year. Pro goes on three. One, two, three. Go. Let's go, baby. What are you? I'm on my kid. Neil Smith played his first game as a Denver Bronco against his former team, the Kansas City Chiefs, and former coach, Marty Schottenheimer. What a great way to start it off, and this game means something special to me. Every time I ever played him, it was something special that, you know, I wanted to win. All right, buddy. Come on, man. All right, baby. Welcome to the good side. You know that's right. Then I went to John, I was like, hey. whatever it takes for you to do, I want you to do exactly the same thing you did to me for nine years. The same you did me for nine years. All right. <laughs> If you have to. It was a big game, obviously, for Neil Smith. It really felt like Neil was washed up and didn't have anything left in the tank. There were a lot of situations where Neil Smith was being blocked by two and three guys trying to slow him down. Hey, Neil, what you that's right, keep two in there, keep two in there. For a defensive lineman, that's as good as a sack. No. What's up, Holmes? One, two, three. Hey, and take three on the black, hey, that's baby. Okay, though. That's all right, though. Hey, take three of y'all. If I did less talking in that game, I probably would have been fresher. <laughs> but I got caught up so much in the hype. That's it, Marty. That's three of them. Yelling over to the sideline to Marty like he was going to hear me. I think I used a lot of unnecessary wind that day. Come on, Marty. Come on. Smith found vindication in Denver's 19-3 win. But this was only the beginning of what promised to be an exceptional season. Yeah! In nine of their 16 regular season games, the Broncos scored 30 or more points. And on a Monday night in Mile High Stadium, Denver routed the defending AFC champion Patriots. With each win, the Broncos' confidence swelled. You a little scared? Yeah, you look a little scared. You scared of what we're going to do to them other than... Come on, come on. Put some pressure on. Come on. Denver was applying pressure on both sides of the ball. Yeah! And despite their 6-0 start, the Broncos didn't put any undue pressure on themselves. Yeah! We was having fun and we was putting together wins and we never ever felt that we was going to go undefeated, but we knew we had something special. Denver had a special player in number 30, Terrell Davis. Yeah! 1997, Davis made a name for himself with over 2,000 yards from scrimmage and a name for his touchdown celebration, the Mile High Salute. Game ball for TD and the offensive line. We said we're going to be no-limit soldiers because we're asked to do it all, so we're going to have to be soldiers out here. That was the first game that was actually debuted. And we really tried to get the No Limit Soldiers to stick, 
but it wouldn't. <laughs> the Mile High Salute took it over. You know what? Everybody's got to learn the salute. Go ahead, TD. Let's see that salute one more time. So the fans really got behind the Mile High Salute, and it really turned into something that really spread throughout the country. The undefeated Broncos lost their first game of the season against longtime rival Oakland. The next week, John Elway and his teammates were scheduled to play the Bills in Buffalo. But before departing, they would face an even tougher opponent, Mother Nature. And it starts snowing early that morning, later that afternoon, and it snowed all night. And it's probably 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. So my wife turns on the TV. Now we start to watch the news. We're not really sure when the Broncos charter is going to be leaving now. There's no planes coming in, no planes going out. The streets are all blocked with cars that are stranded on the side of the road. And we're just like, there's absolutely no way we're going to play this game. We don't even have our whole team here. We've got guys that are down in Castle Rock that can't get out. So then you start to hear on the radio and watching television, anybody with four-wheel drives and snowmobiles, could you call this number? So they were calling and going to pick up these players. The buses pull up to the complex. And we're walking out the door. We're actually going to play this game. We had every built-in excuse in the world not to go out and play. But we did, and we were able to come out with a victory. Because even with the adversity surrounding us, we still could go out and play football and play it at a high level. After beating the Bills in overtime, wins over the Seahawks and Panthers gave the Broncos a 9-1 record. But Denver was about to learn how quickly things can change in the NFL a league that does not salute its champion in November. In week 12, Neil Smith returned to Kansas City. You know, everything was different for me. I find myself walking to the Chiefs locker room. <laughs> I really didn't know, you know, how the fans would accept me. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know what? I rocked this house for a long time. I was just putting it in myself. I know these people's going to cheer for me, you know. And, of course, they announced my name. At left end, from Nebraska, number 90, Neil Smith. They booed me. I was in disbelief. And that hurt me more than anything. It hurt even worse after Kansas City's last-second field goal won the game. The loss to the eventual AFC West champion Chiefs was one of three the once dominant Broncos would suffer in their final six games of the regular season. In Pittsburgh, Denver was bullied by the Steelers. We'd call a run play, it was called Fox 2 Run. My responsibility is to block the inside linebacker, who at the time was LeVon Kirkland. They might have had him listed at 265. But I'm telling you, come December, he had to have been all of 300. So I'm already at a disadvantage. We run our Fox 2 run. I kind of find my way through, and LeVon Kirkland knocks me right on my back. He doesn't make the tackle. I think Terrell runs for 13 yards on a particular play. But he knocks me right on my back, full steam ahead. And I'm on my back, and I was sick about that. And then Chris Collinsworth, he says, see, look at Howard Griffin. He doesn't want to block LeVon Kirkland. He's just trying to get out of the way. So I recorded that, stuck it in the old memory bank. I said, I'll see LeVon Kirkland another day. Pittsburgh overcame a 14-point deficit and won 35 to 24. For the first time in 1997, there was doubt in Denver. They, the first team that suddenly beat us, that we knew that we got our butt whipped that day. When things are going great, everything's good. But what happens when things get tough, when your back's against the wall, when people are starting to question you? On a Monday night in San Francisco, the Broncos found out. 
Once again, Denver blew a lead and fell 34 to 17. The loss hurt, but an incident involving linebacker Bill Romanowski threatened to destroy the season. I didn't see it happen, but the next thing you know, you're starting to hear the rumblings. Romo just spit in JJ, in JJ Stokes' face. Did yeah, what? He spit in his face. Here's play before. That's JJ Stokes, I think, talking to Bill Romanowski. Ooh, and there is a, a real lack of social graces on the part of Romanowski. It turned into a race issue at that particular point. Romo spitting into a black man's face. Was it racially motivated? I'd be hard pressed to say it was. But did he do something that could be construed that way? Yeah. And one of the things that was really fueling this is that you could turn on every TV and see Romo right in his face. Things like this can destroy a ball club, and it very well could. And that's when we had this meeting, and, you know, we asked Romanowski, and but he stepped up. He said, you know what, guys, I was wrong. What I did was wrong, you know, and I apologized to him. When emotions are high, logic is low. I think that was a turning point of our whole season right there. You know, if you guys can accept that, well, as a team, we did. I was upset at Romanowski, not because he was white and spitting a black guy's face, because he disrespected another man. And I couldn't condone what he did simply because he was my teammate. If my brother's wrong, he's wrong. I'm mad enough to tell him he's wrong. And that's what I did. I was mad enough to tell Bill Romanowski he was wrong. So there were a lot of questions. And I think we started to question ourselves a little bit, too. There's always concern when you start losing, and all of a sudden when you lose three out of five, you become a lot more short-sighted. Rather than thinking about the big picture, we start thinking about the next week and saying, we've got to turn this around and play better football in order for us to get to the goal of winning a Super Bowl or getting to the playoff. In the regular season finale against the Chargers, Denver won its 12th game. The Broncos had earned a wild-card playoff berth. But had they recaptured the winning formula which had made them the best team in football, earlier in the year. From a team standpoint, we knew going into that San Diego game, we needed to go out and prove to ourselves that we could actually go out and still play good football because forget everybody else, they had already written us off. These guys are done. Stick a fork in them. One year after upsetting the Broncos, the Jacksonville Jaguars returned to Mile High Stadium for the wild card playoffs. I think that everybody on our football team felt the same way, that we're still, still so upset about the year before and what happened the year before, that there was no doubt that if we got another shot of them in Mile High Stadium, that we were gonna take care of business. Are you ready for the revenge today? Let's get it done! People believed that we would actually lose that game. It wasn't gonna happen though. It was time to exercise the demons. And we knew how we'd do it. We were going to run the ball right down their throat. Hand off Davis running right side. Davis is at five. Touchdown! Standing up goes Terrell Davis. Three possessions produced three touchdowns. But in the second half, Jacksonville stormed back. Trailing by four points, the Jaguars focused their attack on the Bronco, who had the most to lose. one tough guy that can take a lick and get up from it. He came back. And now, John Elway, the good news for Bronco fans, out on the field. Oh, I can't believe he's still in there. He's out of the cold. In a postseason portent of things to come, John Elway's toughness and a punishing ground game that registered 310 rushing yards helped Denver get its revenge on Jacksonville. Right. 
head. They said it was a wind knock. No, it was my head. They knock you out. Oh, good job, buddy. And I was seeing stars. We knew that we had the hard road to take. We had one down, but now we got to go back into Kansas City. In frozen Arrowhead Stadium, the Broncos and Chiefs were locked in a defensive battle. Ball control and field position were of the utmost importance. It was the epitome of Marty Schottenheimer football, and John Elway knew that. We had fourth and one on about our own 40-yard line. And I can remember coming to the sideline, and I see it in Mike's head. I, Mike's thinking, go, he's going to go for it, he's going to go for it, he's going to go for it. And we really struggled on offense. They played great defense the whole day. And I remember saying to Mike, saying, Mike, beat Marty to his own game. What's that? I hear you. Beat Marty to his own game, which meant punt the ball, push him back, and let's play defense because that's what's got us there. And so he ended up punting the ball. Punt it. By the fourth quarter, the Broncos were protecting a 14 to 10 lead. Denver's defense, not John Elway, would have to win this one. Kansas City had the ball last, you know, and it was driving. And all the years, Denver always had an opportunity to stop people, but they never did. Come on, man, come on, come on. So this was the center stage for us to make a play. Just gotta watch it over there. Once again, Kansas City had a chance to win on the game's final play. This time, they needed a touchdown. This can't happen to us again. Once again, though, the defense stepped up to the challenge. Now they gotta go for the end zone. Here they gotta go for the end zone. Cutback has him up at the line of scrimmage. Clock is running, 27, 26. It can't move quickly enough for the Broncos. Slam it! Slam it! Cutback, this is fourth and two and a half. This is the game. Slam it! Cutback into the end zone. Pass is going to be knocked down. has done it, and they are stunned here at Arrowhead Stadium. All right, bud. We did it. We did it, boy. We did it. And this baby is over. Denver returns to the AFC Championship game. They'll be in Pittsburgh next Sunday. The winner will go to the Super Bowl. When he got back into the locker room, it was real exciting. But that wasn't what I was happy about, because we got to go to Pittsburgh. All I could think about, LeVon Kirkland. See, I got something for LeVon Kirkland next week. The Denver Broncos were one more road win away from reaching the Super Bowl. Nobody thought we'd beat Kansas City in Kansas City. And certainly, they didn't believe that we would beat Pittsburgh in Three Rivers. I always think it's an advantage once to play a team a second time, knowing that you learn a lot more from the loss than if we had beaten them the time we were in Pittsburgh early in the year. So I think we had the advantage having played them, having lost to them, to be able to correct what we did wrong in that game. Go, 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 go! Terrell Davis, who ran for 139 yards, gave the Broncos an early lead. Near right, near right, zoom A, right, 18 pitch. Toss, right side, Davis, cuts up. Terrell Davis, five, Terrell Davis, yeah! Into the end zone, touchdown! The Broncos score first. Retribution was clearly on the mind of the Broncos, especially fullback Howard Griffith. After being run over by LeVon Kirkland earlier in the year, Griffith and Terrell Davis teamed to cut the massive linebacker down to size. Why are you cut? Hey man, why are you 300 pounds? Griffith's value as a pass catcher would also be demonstrated. It was float pass left. And I kind of fake at the defensive end, like I'm going to block him, and 
and I slip out into the flat. Sounds easy, but it's really a tough throw. Ball's behind me, I reach back, I pull it in. Throws to the flat, one hand, a catch for Howard Griffin inside the 10. Inside the five to the pylon, touchdown! What if I drop that ball? Could it change the tides of everything that happened throughout that game and in history. Oh, what a catch by Howard Griffith out of the backfield. So you get an opportunity. You have to be able to take advantage of it. The Broncos' offense took advantage of every opportunity. And in the third quarter, Don't get scared, baby. Denver's Don't get scared. defense protected the lead. Stewart Come will throw hey, short yo. drop into the That's end zone. Pass it. Intercepted. Yeah! In the end zone, right. a terrible throw. Right to him. Pittsburgh Steeler quarterback Cordell Stewart was rattled by a defense that forced two second-half turnovers. Yeah. Late in the fourth quarter, the Broncos needed one more first down to kill the clock and clinch a berth in Super Bowl 32. Old Three River Stadium, the fans are so close to us. You could just hear the stands behind us just literally moving up and down in Three River Stadium. And the only thing you can see is these yellow tiles just swinging, swinging, swinging. Steelers have all three timeouts left, and this place is going nuts. Two minutes left, third and six for Denver at the Bronco 15-yard line. They lead 24-21. I can remember the play coming in from the sideline, and Mike says 324 all stop. I know. I want it. And so I get in the huddle, and I say spread right through 24, I'll stop. And Shannon goes, that's not in the game plan. It's not in the game plan. I said, it is now. Now go get open. Oh, I think we got it. Come on, come on. Snap is good. Five-man rush. John throws. Pass caught. First down on the 30-yard line. Shannon short. Biggest first down of the year. L.A. to short for 18 yards. Oh, baby. Shannon Sharp made the player of that game to get us to the Super Bowl. He make a catch over the middle, grab the first down, and we go and run the clock out. And those tops did disappear, and you can hear a pin drop. a nice trophy and a lot of people have them and a lot of people are proud of them. this right here is not the one we want but believe me if you don't have a Lombardi trophy the other thing is a paperweight the next one is a whole lot sweeter congratulations <laughs> When the AFC champions arrived in San Diego, the media focus was not on the game John Elway and the Broncos were about to play, but on the Super Bowls they had lost. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that could have ever brought us to the three Super Bowls uh, with, this, with the cast that we had than John Elway. I'm proud of the fact that we got the three Super Bowls. I don't care if we won or lost. I'm proud that we did what we did. I don't consider them failures. I mean, we lost a game, but I think if you look at those years, it was a heck of an accomplishment for us to get here, and we didn't play well when we got here. In pro football's biggest game, Elway never seemed to play his best. Number seven was portrayed as the greatest quarterback who couldn't win the big one, and to him, it was no laughing matter. With time running out in his career, Elway was thrilled to get one more shot, even if his mother wasn't. I can remember calling my mom after we beat Pittsburgh, and she said, oh my God, we have to go back to the Super Bowl. And I said, like, yeah, Mom, we have to go back. I guess with the disappointment from the year before of losing to Jacksonville in the first round of the playoffs and having been to the three Super Bowls earlier in my career, I just wanted a chance to go back and, and play. The quarterback who had once carried his team to three Super Bowls entered his fourth with a team that could carry him. At 37, Elway had gone from superstar to sentimental favorite everywhere but Green Bay. I think he deserves for people to nationally want him to win, but 
I don't care. I'm sick of hearing about, oh, don't you feel sorry for him? No, I don't feel sorry. We have the three-time MVP and have the verge of winning another Super Bowl back-to-back. -back. That should be a real big focus. But he's getting overshadowed by a guy that's probably been in the Hall of Fame because he hadn't won a Super Bowl. I mean, give me a handkerchief. I, it wouldn't even be wet. It'd be dry because we have no tears for him. The one thing he did not want to be saddled with, and he didn't want to have to answer this question. Do you consider your career complete if you didn't win a Super Bowl? Anybody that tells you yes, probably lying. Do you consider your career complete if you didn't win a Super Bowl? Yeah. It was a standard answer because it's really the only answer I had. But the bottom line is, no, I would not have been satisfied if we were never able to uh, say that I was a world champion and wore a Super Bowl ring. In San Diego, Howard Griffith learned that preparing for a Super Bowl is different than playing in one. Phil Simms was out at practice, and we were just talking. And he said, you know, Howard, if you're fortunate enough to have the offense introduced, it's going to be probably one of the most powerful moments that you'll ever remember. Yeah, 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 whatever. So since we have the future Hall of Famer, John Elway, offense has to be introduced. Okay. It was like my entire life went past me in an instant. Because you think about all the different situations that you may have been in in life where you had to make a decision, am I going to go this way or that way? Georgia. Knowing that if you had made a different decision at some point in your life, you might not be standing at tunnel getting ready to get your name called at the Super Bowl. At fullback from Illinois, number 29. Howard was the most amazing feeling that I've ever had. The warm feelings quickly disappeared. Over, 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 over! Brett Favre showed why the Packers were 14-point favorites, scoring on their first possession. But the Broncos answered with their own drive. Ten plays which demonstrated their determination to play power football against the defending world champions. Elway, handoff, Davis, in the end zone, touchdown! Yeah! Have pretty good way for the Broncos to answer the Packers' opening drive. But what that first drive showed, not only us, but everybody else, we're here to play football. Can you match up? Because we're going to be here all day long. Come on, baby, let's get that turnover! In the first half, the Broncos forced two turnovers. Brett Favre and the Packers were losing their grip on the game. But eventual MVP Terrell Davis, who was experiencing a migraine headache, was losing his vision. What's that? Let's see. Okay, just do this. Coach Shanahan goes to him and says, hey, they're never going to believe we're going to run the ball if you're not in the game. You don't worry about seeing on this place because we're going to fake it to you the 15 lead. But if you're not in there, they won't believe we're going to run. Okay? And as any player would do, okay. When Terrell got to the huddle, he says, hey, I can't see. And I see, he goes, I said, well, just go to the left and just run straight ahead and I'll adjust to you. I said, don't worry about it. Just go left. You just run and I'll adjust to you. <laughs> Play fake. Elway rolls right. He can run it in. John, it will trot into the end zone. Touchdown. Fake 15 quarterback keep pass right. And I'm licking my chops. Wow. Made a big play in the AFC Championship game. Now I'm going to get the ball again. I come out. I'm wide open. I said, oh, this is going to be so easy. And John points at a linebacker. So I turn to make the block. And he runs it right into the end zone. He could have dumped that ball to Howard Griffith easily, but Elway walks into the end zone. And I was like, oh, my big shot. But then, as any great leader would say, hey, but I just didn't trust myself. Vintage John Elway there. 
And the 37-year-old making it happen with his legs. Right move. No, right. Nothing was more evident of really how desperate they were. But as you see the sight of Eugene Robinson screaming. We are playing the Indianapolis Colts. We're playing the Indianapolis Colts right now. This team is not better than us. They're not even good. And we're letting them, we're letting them do that thing, thing on. We weren't quite the Indianapolis Colts. He got a concussion. He's scared to run the ball. He ain't running hard no more. Or you see Sharper. He's scared. They out the game. You better take him out. We knew they didn't have a chance. Terrell Davis's eyesight returned, and the Packers saw him run for 157 yards and three touchdowns. But the most eye-opening run of Super Bowl 32 was a leap by a man in whom the Broncos placed their faith. LA can run. Come on, John, come on. Come on. Inside the 10, head first. He flies inside oh, the five-yard line. Yeah, great. We'd been practicing that pass play the whole week, and it was a play that I wasn't essentially really that fond of, but it was a play that went in that week specifically for the, for the Green Bay Packers. Even during practice that week, I'd ask Mike, I said, well, what happens if they don't play that defense? He said, it's 100%. They'll play that defense. They played that defense the whole year. I said, okay, so in comes that play. Okay, point slice. And sure enough, I'm a shotgun. It's third and six, and I look out there, and they're not in that defense. And so I knew that I was going to have to find a hole. So I took my drop and was looking for a place to get through to try to make something happen. When I got outside, the first thing I did, and you can see my eyes, I looked to see where the first down marker was. I knew that they were probably thinking that I was going to go low, and I put that old five-inch vertical jump on them, and I went over the top and was able to get the uh, first down. One of the greatest individual efforts that you will ever see in the Super Bowl, because in that split second, you knew that he wanted it, and wanted it more than anybody else on the football field. Elway's determined run led to a Davis touchdown and a 24-17 lead. But the Broncos could not put away the Packers. Green Bay didn't just say, we're going to let these guys win it. Brett Favre is not over there saying, John Elway sure would look nice with a Super Bowl ring on. He tried to win that game as well. Brett Favre wanted a second straight ring. John Elway was thrilled to still have a chance to win his first. I can remember sitting in my room the whole week before and just praying. I said, God, and all I asked for was, God, just give me a chance to win this late in the game. Just have us in the game, you know, with four, five, six minutes to go to where we have an opportunity to be world champs. Tied at 24 with barely three minutes to play, Elway's prayer was answered. But this time, he didn't have to be a hero in order for Denver to win. The quarterback who once willed the Broncos to so many last-second victories threw but one pass on the 49-yard drive. His talented team did the rest. Denver drove to the Green Bay one, took the clock under two minutes, and forced the Packers to make a difficult decision. The meeting of the minds over there on the other side of Green Bay decided that they were going to let us score, which in hindsight made sense because all we were going to do was run the clock out. And the hearts are pounding in Denver. Nobody but Terrell here. Come on, hit it. And it was the biggest hole I'd ever seen before in my life. Davis, into the end zone, walking, standing up. Can you say Denver is in the lead? We're sitting here, it's like, oh. We are great. Did you see that hole? That's unbelievable. Third rushing touchdown. That's a Super Bowl record for TD. As usual, Elway had done his part. Now, Denver's defense needed to do theirs. When offense come off and saying that they just let us score, they just let us score. I guess they're trying to get the ball back. And we all just, just looked at each other and said, no, it's our time. If we're going to win, we have to, we have to stop them. It's our deal. Baby, somebody make a play. Come on, baby, come on. With 36 seconds to go, will they bring pressure? Here they come. Favre 
Pass over the middle is going to be incomplete. Oh, incomplete Atwater with a big time hit. Hilliard is down. Atwater is down. And Brooks is down. Atwater knocked out everybody, including himself, on that play. We got three guys out. Atwater, Hillier, and Crockett. The Broncos were one play away from their first world championship. Let's go, do it again, let's go! In 38 years, without a championship in football has come down to one play. Keep fighting, keep fighting. Fourth and six with 32 seconds to go. One play. Super Bowl. Come on. This is it. Come on. Blitz is on. Mark. It is he throws. Pass is going to be incomplete. Denver Hall. Denver's going to win it. Are you kidding me? And I just turn around and it looked like a volcano coming out. All our guys on the sideline running on the field. Jumping down, I just was in disbelief. Perhaps no one was more stunned than John Elway. After carrying the Broncos for so many years, his team finally carried him to the only distinction he ever really wanted, world champion. After 15 years of work and three Super Bowl losses and all the different things that, uh, that I'd gone through in my career, to finally reach the pinnacle of your sport and what you love to do, it's hard to explain. And because uh, I still get shivers when I think about it. I still get shivers because I can remember exactly how it felt. And that's why the whole thing took me so long to really realize the impact of what had really happened. I had finally reached the pinnacle and that's to be able to say that I was on a Super Bowl winning team. I'm so proud of you. You know how nice that ring's gonna look on your finger. There's one thing I want to say here tonight. It's only four words. This one's for John. It was so poignant that it really spoke volumes about what John meant not only to the organization, but to all Bronco fans around. It was a huge weight that was lifted off of his back because it was the game that he couldn't win. I think Mr. B said it himself, you know, he's like, hey, you know, this one's for John. And I was right behind him and Neil. <laughs>